Hello, and welcome to Office Hours. If you've not seen our show before, we are a question and answer discussion uh, where you can submit your questions for our first hour. We'll be focusing on that. During our week, we'll have a special topic that we'll focus on or a special guest. Um, this week, or this Saturday, actually Saturdays, we do education hours. So tune, uh, tune in with us, stay with us with uh, John Snyder. We'll be taking us into a ruthless redo of our PowerPoint presentations. So let's get right into our questions. Mitch, what do we have? Well, it's not Actually, Mitch, it's, it's me, today. but that's okay. Bo <laughs> Cordell from Charleston has our first question today, and he asks, when would you use Zoom Rooms to transport an SDI multi-viewer feed for internal viewing versus something like a pair of high vision Makitos? Sorry about that, Ken. Go ahead, Alex. 100% of the time. <laughs> you know, 95% because certainty drives you, makes you crazy, but 100%. I'm <laughs> sorry, that's quite a little... 30, 30, zero, um, zero dark 30. So anyway, um, yeah, the Makitos are really expensive to do that. Um, you can probably find all kinds of things. If you're trying to take it out of a truck or out of a fly pack, uh, we've used Zoom over and over and over again for, um, uh, you know, all kinds of multi-views for events. And we found them to be very stable. I mean, if you have a really unstable connection, maybe the SRT would make a difference, but you're paying a lot of money uh, for something to do that. So I, I would, you'd have a lot more flexibility and the potential to put a lot more into it. So now with Zoom Rooms being able to handle up to three, I think up to three SDI feeds at a time, um, six feeds total, um, you, you could, you know, given that you're not worried about a lot of different audio feeds, because I think you only get one feed of audio out of that. Um, but the Zoom Room should be able to let you put a lot of multi-views up all at one time from one computer. Um, so I would, I would, and it's much easier for folks on the other end to just jump into a Zoom and they could even talk to each other if they needed to. So I think it'd be pretty good, uh, pretty good solution. Alex, what is the Makita's, what is their um, advantage? Where um, would you well, Makito, this? a Makito is, I mean, it's for video transport, it's, it's going to be an SRT, well, typically an SRT feed. I think it can do a couple things, but it does point to point. So you can, you can send video relatively stably between one point and another at a pretty low latency, um, or you can increase the latency, have more stability. Um, and we've used Makitos in the past and they're, they're good boxes. They're just, I think that the pair is like $15,000 or something like that. So it's a pretty expensive, um, you know, solution. Uh, we, I, I guess you can also send them to the, you know, send them out and broadcast from them, but we've never used them that way. We've always used the Makitos as a point to point transport. So, um, but, but either way, um, if, if it's for just internal viewing, if it's for production use, I wouldn't necessarily, I would probably pick the Makito. Um, but if it's for, because uh, that's what a, a lot of Makitos are used for um, is actual production and mission critical solutions, um, and and they're 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 good at that that thing. Um, but if they uh, and they they handle a lot of bandwidth changes, there's a lot they're used in places that sometimes have a lot of challenges with bandwidth, and they they're as stable as you can be in that in that environment. Um, so um, so I think that they're, they're they are good pieces of hardware. But if I was using them for internal like people just watching the multi view that every frame doesn't matter and you're just trying to, you know, watch what's going on, I would definitely uh, use the Zoom Rooms. Okay, got you there. It's uh, kind of flattering that uh, those two differences of solutions have yeah. been considered right next to each other. So, mm -hmm. fantastic. Let's go to our next question. Ken? Next question comes from me in Seattle. When adjusting cameras, some people use a white card to white balance an image, but others use a gray card. How can they both be proper? Mitchell. I'll use the right card for the right job. I use both, uh, an 18% gray card to set my lighting up so you can see how the lighting light falls on the card. And then when it comes to white balancing, a matte white card works well. You don't want to reflect light back into the lens of the camera. So um, make sure that it's a card that has a matte surface on it. And when you're holding it, well, it's slightly off, at, off center so it doesn't uh, throw light back at the camera itself. So both is the answer. Alex? Yeah, I only use cards that have black, white, and, um, and gray on them all at the same time. Usually they're a larger gray card with a black and a white because when I look at it, in, because I use scopes all the time, so I don't, uh, it's not, it's very unusual. If I'm picking up a card and putting it in front of a camera, I have scopes connected to that camera somewhere. Like, you know, like that's what I wanted to see because I want to see where that black level is in the scopes and where the white level is in the scopes and where my gray level is in the scopes and where they're, you know, and, and uh, whether they're even across the channels. So if I'm looking at RGB, 
if a gray, the gray card allows me to see that, well, the gray, white, and black cards, and you'll see, yeah, Mitchell's got a much more complicated one. They make some that are just that gray with a black and a white next to it. And when you have those, what happens is you can, you can look at that in the scopes and you can look at your RGB parade and you can see whether the grays all are the same. You know, it's not just whether it's, it looks gray or whether it, where it is in exposure, is it are, are the grays in that scope even? Are the whites even? Are the blacks even? Am I fully exposed, you know, in those areas? And so that, that makes it a lot easier. Of course, then after that, you start moving to x right charts and um, Dumont, you know, DSC chroma Dumont charts, um, which are the, what we typically use on our cameras. Um, but the, but it's, not, it's always good to have something that's just going to show you gray, black, and white. Now, what we do with black in a Dumont chart is we have a cavity behind it. So it's actually a velvet cavity that, that's Velcroed. And when you pull it open and it creates a pure black um, you know, because it's not an actual surface, it actually goes into a black little hole that's all that's all there. And so you get really what is truly black, you know, in that um, in that environment. So that that helps a lot in us for us to figure out what we're, you know, what we're shooting. Thanks for that, Alex and Mitchell. I'd like to way back Ed? Yeah, in a pinch, a piece of white paper will do it. Yeah. Fantastic. So your critical must haves. Uh, in your bag. And, and again, if you're shooting log, it becomes less important. <laughs> like if you're shooting or shooting raw out of a camera, not log, but raw out of a camera, um, you know, that becomes, you know, how you do that is less because you're going to, you're going to figure that out in post if you're shooting raw from a, from one of your cameras. Thank you, panel. Let's go to our next question. Next one comes from Javier Alfaro in Mexico City, Mexico, and he asks, Waves and Isotope have already started their Black Friday deals. Are there any new plugins the panel is considering buying? Mitchell? I think I'm going to update my uh, a Waves Clarity plugin. Uh, of course, Wave has been known for dropping prices back and forth, sort of like the Dow Jones. Uh, and then the other thing I'm looking at is the Isotope, uh, their RX Post Suite 7, which is almost like 50% off for the uh, Black Friday. And uh, the other product that they have that I heard talked about when we were talking about our ADR this week, uh, the dialogue match, which is a cool way to match dialogue to the environment. So you get the proper room tone behind it and the proper match and timing. It's a pretty nifty uh, little plug in, usually around $500. I don't know what the, the uh, Black Friday price is. And where do you like to host your plugins, Mitchell? Uh, I have them both on my Mac and my uh, PC. It depends on what I'm using. My Mac, I do all my editing. So anything relating to um, post-production sound ends up on the Mac. And then for audio, everything else is on my uh, on my PC. And if you use the uh, the Waves application, I forgot what it's called, Waves Central, I think, um, you can bounce them back and forth between the units because they talk to the, uh, the mothership and it tells uh, which one's allowed to be used. Alex, do you have a budget? for some new plugins? Uh, I might. I'll probably look at the Isotope one, see if there's anything I haven't bought already. Um, so I think that, um, but I think, uh, I think it's, I think it's interesting. I'm curious whether this business model really works. Is that this idea, you know, cause I think that with waves and, and with Isotope to some degree, but definitely with waves, I don't even consider buying them at retail. It's kind of like you, Udemy, uh, the website, you know, they, they sell their training for $10 and then, and then it goes back to $70 and $70 just means don't do anything until the next sale, you know, <laughs> you know, and so I think that waves has us so conditioned to not buy anything, uh, if it's not in a sale moment and they have like two or three sales a year where it's, it's all like 80% off or whatever. And I'm just like, I don't, I just don't know because it just means that you can't buy them until then. <laughs> like, I mean, that's how you, that's how I look at it. Like, well, I can't buy that right now. Um, you know, you only buy that stuff if you're in some weird pinch that that plugin has to solve at that moment. So I, I don't know if it's a great business model, but I'll probably buy a couple. I usually go through it during Black Friday and buy you know, a couple hundred dollars worth of new things that I probably won't use next year. But when I do, I'll feel really good about it. What, you don't go to the car dealership and just pay retail for whatever they're, whatever they're asking? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. I don't, buy, I don't buy new cars. It's a waste of money. <laughs> <laughs> so. Go ahead, Mitchell. What Alex just said, and I have to resist because I have that geek syndrome about buying stuff. He who dies with the last most plugins wins. Um, try not to buy the expensive plugins until they have a job that justifies buying it. Exactly. Uh, you don't, you don't I, when, just amass them. 
Yeah, when I buy, usually if I buy a plugin more than about $50, it's because there's a job that needs to execute that and I can push it against the budget. Even if they're not on sale? When mm. at that moment, yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, but but when they're $30 off, I buy the ones that I needed last year and hope that I need them next year, <laughs> so. It almost seems like, you know, for people that uninitiated, they're like, oh, that plugin, okay, I'll go get it. Okay, well, that's the price, uh, you know, I'll just pay for the price and it's like this little secret like they're gonna go on sale here. I know it hope. feels but then you just here's the problem is is that you you feel like a mark when it goes way down and and that's the that's the part that I think isn't a great experience for the if you're just a, if you're a, a real production person that's just gonna buy stuff as needed and then you see it for 80 percent off it just leaves you with a bad feeling about the process and, and I think that that's the that's the challenge yeah good point Mitchell yeah when I'm living in a cardboard box out front of my house here um I'll have a sign that says, we'll work for plugins. I thought that was a van by the river. I'm working on that. <laughs> You're moving up. <laughs> yes, I am. Uh, or you could just say, plug me in. You know? <laughs> exactly. Probably, probably. probably or fonts. Work for fonts. Nice. Let's go to our next question. Thank heavens. Uh, Douglas Carmichael <laughs> gives us a web link to uh, Sennheiser and asks... Has anyone worked with the Sennheiser Mobile Connect hearing assistance system? I have not. I I did hear the news that um, uh, Sennheiser did uh, sell off some of their um, production to the the hearing assistance there. So I assume that's what the the link is. Sorry, uh, Douglas didn't get a chance to take a look at that earlier, but uh, I wonder. Uh, about that move, it really says something about, um, you know, maybe the commoditization of things. Ken, you have a thought? Is hearing assistance uh, what one might use in, um, well, in, in my example, in a, uh, a congregation where uh, the people in the back can't hear uh, clearly what the, what the speaker is enunciating? And why is Sennheiser uh, in the news about all this? My impression was that they actually got into like the hearing aid uh, type of systems. Now, you know, what type of add-ons or, you know, uh, accommodations that they have. I know some of the fancy uh, hearing assistance uh, models, um, you know, have Bluetooth uh, connectivity or some other ways of, you know, fancier. These, are, these aren't your granddad's uh, hearing aids, perhaps. Alex, you have a thought? Yeah, I mean, I think that one of the things that's happened is, is that because of the new deregula deregulation of the hearing aid market, uh, you have both hearing aid uh, incumbents trying to get the last dollars that, that are left at the 80% margins that they were working at, and the, and the new folks trying to get in and, and uh, jockey for position as the, as the chaos ensues. So, so I think that there's, we're, we're going to see a lot of de you know, uh, unstable markets for the next year, which is a very dangerous for the incumbents and very exciting for the for the uh, entrance uh, of the market. Um, it's probably going to lead to a lot of people going deaf faster um, because uh, the, the pro you know the, the the issue is is that there is a it's good that it's deregulated. It's going to lower the price for a lot of things, but without that, without actually having to go see an audiologist and ha without having to do all those things, people are going to put things in their ears that are way too loud and 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 aren't working and. That, you know, it's going to be, there's going to be some chaos, <laughs> you know, and we're going to see things on MSNBC about people going deaf because they, they did this and everything else and it'll settle itself out. But we just have to know that, that there is going to be a lot of people doing what people do, which is lots of stupid things. <laughs> you know, so, so there's going to be a group of people that are going to do a bunch of dumb things with the, with this because it's not regulated anymore. Um, it's good overall because the, the pricing was just insane you know, like what was happening with, with ear, hearing aids. And there's more and more people moving into that market. Um, so, so it makes sense to do it, but we just have to know that for the next couple of years until people really figure out who's doing it well and how to control that. Um, you know, Apple probably does it better than most because they send you little warnings like, hey, this is too loud and this is, this is doing what it needs to do. And they're probably doing it better than most. Harshit? To go to uh, Dennis's point and as well as to answer some of what Ken said, Sennheiser have sold a bit of their uh, product line to a consumer-based level. So the hearing aid company that has bought that consumer bit is, that's where I guess this sound assistant app is coming from. 
uh, or hearing assistant. And so, like, if you look at the Momentum Force, their consumer-grade headphone, it says Sennheiser Consumer. And that's how I imagine that they've kind of split off into the two elements of uh, maybe mobile phones, uh, things like that nature. So the Momentums, you know, they'll gear towards the consumer side of things. And it literally says that. Whereas on the uh, prosumer side, we have the like IE400s and other uh, sorts of uh, the IE300s, for example, for in-ears. Uh, where they're used in a different manner. So those are sold still under the Sennheiser name, and they still own the uh, product line, but they sell at a higher price point with the prosumer Sennheiser products, whereas the consumer line, whereas the Momentum 4s and such you might be um, familiar with, that bit got sold off to this other hearing aid company, which is still part of Sennheiser. And I don't know if you know, Harshid, if this is a case of them really purchasing a name or mostly the... Um... The IP. I think it's more to, so to, IP. Okay. Mitchell? Yeah, to Alex's point, sound levels are subjective. They're not quantitative uh, You can't unless you have a metering system on it. So people are going to abuse it. If I could jump into a time machine and go back 40 years, I would tell my earlier self to take those Pro 4 AA's off my head uh, when I'm DJing at the radio station because that's why I have tinnitus is because I listen to radio way too loud. Yeah, I know um, a lot of um, phones then will give you a warning uh, when you've cranked the volume to a higher level. So hopefully uh, another generation gets the benefit of uh, those uh, precautions. Let's go to our next question. Next question comes from Alex Lindsay here on the panel. And Alex uh, brings forth, what does our panel think, the t how does our panel think the Twitter saga will pan out? All right, well, let's discuss this, uh, John, and then maybe Nigel. I think it's a really interesting test case of what happens when a public company goes private. Instead of having millions of shareholders, there's just a few shareholders now. So Twitter has the opportunity to really focus on adding value to those stakeholders and can be more opinionated at providing a product. They don't have to try to appease everybody. Likely, I'd say probably 70% chance it just becomes a toxic place that nobody wants to join ever again. Uh, but there's a 30% chance that it'll really have a single vision that is beneficial to the community as well as to the world. Interesting waiting there, John. Um, Nigel? Yeah, so when I think about these sorts of things, I, I use what someone told me, the 10-10-10 rule. And so you can think about this 10 days out, 10 months out, or 10 years out. And I think if you think about it 10 uh, days out, then you just see the mess that's going on today. 10 months out, I think it'll start to shake out and it will be clearer. And of course, no one really knows what Elon's thinking. If I think 10 years out, I think that what Twitter could become is a storage space for news and information that we filter and deliver to ourselves as clients in a interesting and useful way. Uh, think of, a, 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 you know, Apple... Apple Publications, whatever the app's called, does it with formal magazines. Think about it as data. So I, I use Twitter every day. I've been on Twitter since uh, 2007, early 2007. I was one of the early users. And I use lists. So I don't see most of the rubbish everybody else does because I have very carefully curated lists of people I read every day by certain topics. And I find it a very valuable news service, a very valuable information service. And I just get rid of the rest. And so a bit like the internet, I think there'll always be the rubbish, but we'll get tools to filter it and deliver us the information as we need it. Mitchell. Can't stop the people. I think that the people will decide not so much... Uh, uh, Elon uh, deciding he may do some stuff to play with the uh, uh, his new forty four billion dollar toy, but as Alex suggests, uh, and using the word pan out, panning out doesn't always pan gold. It sometimes is a uh, zilch. Peter. Well, it's certainly been entertaining up until the last last Thursday, and then it started to get, as we all know, a bit chaotic. Uh, using uh, Nigel's 10 10 10 rule, I think, you know, I would go, you know, 10 days, 10 months, and 10 years as well. But I think it's going to be very painful for the next 10 months as they sort out what are, what is their goal. Um, I, I, like Alex and, and Nigel, carefully curate my list so that I don't see a lot of garbage. But every once in a while, particularly when I, you know, help my, uh, my uh, daughter with her phone, 
I realize that she's just getting an unfiltered list nine times out of 10. And there's absolute chaos out there. So I, I, I think the chaos is going to extend for a longer period of time as, as the, uh, as Elon figures out what he wants to do. This whole thing about uh, verified users is an interesting uh, example of that. Harshid. The progression of this is really interesting because it's a departmental thing at this point too. Uh, the trends in the way of accessibility, I've just looked in a couple of discords that I'm a part of and they fired the whole accessibility department. So this is almost like a departmental firing. And so that's just interesting that you pulled that piece out of your system. Um, I wonder how it's going to work for them for the future. Ken? And from the Department of Curmudgery, um, I find it interesting that uh, so many people are interested in this. It's a novel thing to follow in the news, but we already have the ability to, to deal with Twitter much the same way that uh, we deal with junk mail that shows up in the, in the mailbox every day. Um, one day out of seven, I might get something uh, that's uh, of interest, and the other days of the week, the, the letter carrier gets some exercise, and that's the way I view Twitter. The next person to speak has an interesting way of making sure that uh, the detritus, detritus is uh, filtered out. Maybe Alex can tell us about that. Go ahead, Alex. Yeah, my Twitter hasn't changed very much, <laughs> I have to admit. You know, and part of, I'm probably one of the more aggressive people about, as Ken knows, I've tweeted about it recently. Um, I use Twitter, I've been using Twitter like Nigel since very early days. In fact, there was a, a time when I was in the top 100 of Twitter with, with all 6,000 followers that I had. Um, and so, uh, so, you know, I paid a lot of attention to it. It's probably the only thing, I, the only social media network that I still you know, I'm part of, you know, in, in that area. Um, but what's made it work was when I figured out how to filter words. And so I go in and I filter out probably 150 terms. And if I look at something, I go, mm, I don't like that. I don't like that. Either. I don't like that tweet. I just go in and just hit filter. Um, and I put, I find a word that would describe that tweet, something in the tweet that if I take that word out, I'll probably get a bunch of things and, you know, with it. And so I just take that out and I put it in there. And, and, you know, people accuse me of, filtering quote unquote reality, but you know, Twitter's not reality, Twitter's insanity, <laughs> you know? And so I'm just filtering out all the crazy people um, talking about things that they have no idea what they're talking about. You know, like as someone who works all over the world, you watch people type things in with opinions about, and they act like they have a doctorate in that, in, in, in that, um, that concept. And they've, they obviously, when, as someone who, you know, when they, especially when people tweet about things that you were at and work, were working on, you realize how insane they are, <laughs> you know? And so, so you just need to filter that stuff out and have the, and, and, um, and what I end up with is I, I have a lot of programmers, audio designers, Apple geeks, movie geeks, um, that, that I follow that, um, and, and people around that, that it's just this really fun place for me to go. And so, you know, the insanity of it, what makes people, everybody upset is this unfiltered view of, people, crazy people who everybody is equal, like, you know, like everybody, everybody has an equal voice to it or a relatively equal voice to it, regardless of their intelligence <laughs> so, and, and their understanding of what they're doing. That is insane. And so when you start to filter through all of that and the lists that I know a lot of people that use lists, the list that Nigel used, the filtering that I use, you end up with this great product, you know, like that, that, that gives you a lot of information that I wouldn't get otherwise, you know, like, like, you know, I don't know where else I would find that. I don't really surf the web for it anymore. I surf Twitter. Like I go, I look at the news feeds from Flipboard and, and Apple news and Twitter, you know, and I go through it, but it's not news like news news. It's like, uh, which is not, has its own issues. <laughs> so, um, uh, the, it is, but it's things that I'm passionate about finding new tidbits about things, whether it's, you know, uh, visual effects or, or audio or media or whatever. I'm passionate about that. Where else am I going to find that? Some website with a ton of ads, you know, like I'm going to find it on Twitter. And so, so I think that it's, it's gotten a real opportunity. I actually love the charging as someone who doesn't have a blue check mark, <laughs> who never tried to get one. I love charging for the blue check mark. I think he should charge a hundred dollars for the blue check mark every month. If you want a blue check mark, it should cost you a lot of money because what you want to think about is you want to think about a huge canopy you know, in the Amazon and think about what happens to the little guys like us when you cut down the big trees, <laughs> it just suddenly there's a ton of sunlight. So, um, so the, uh, so I'm all for 
you know, a bunch of people leaving and, and I'm all for, you know, cause he's not, he's not taking away your Twitter account. If you don't pay $8, he's just taking away the, some little blue check mark that I never bothered to get. So, um, you know, and I, and, and not only have, it's not like I'm sour grapes. Like I tried to get the blue check mark and didn't get it. And now I'm just bitter. I never tried. I was like, why? <laughs> like, why would I need that? So I understand if you're a, if you're a movie star, maybe you want it, but I think that it should cost you real money. I think it should cost, you should, you should be underwriting Twitter if you're getting the benefit of that blue. And I think that the actual, the other features that they added to the blue thing makes it more valuable. The, the, you know, being in a special lane, you know, getting all this, I, I, they're actually adding some cool features to it. So, so it'll be really interesting to see, you know, how it goes. I don't think it's nearly, I don't think he's as crazy as he sounds. Um, and I don't think that all of that stuff's going to go away. I think that he's just clearing house and then he'll put things back. I think that what's happened, what we're seeing right now is he's going to clear out a, a culture and then pull, pull other things back in and start to, you know, make them more streamlined because it did have a lot of people that probably weren't necessary. Maybe when we start seeing GoFundMes for a blue check mark, we know we're in the right place for yeah, exactly. pricing. Go ahead, Nigel. I, I wanted to add something to blue check mark because I am bitter. Um, no. Uh, I've, you know, I, I look at people who have a lot less followers than me and they have one and I get upset. I actually think the blue, the blue check marks a really interesting idea they've never pursued in a better way that, that there is, I would pay to be uh, proved who I am to be under certain controls that might drive me to certain lists that, so I think there's all sorts of subscription services that can be put in here. And, and the other thing I'd say is be very careful of anything you're hearing today about this team got fired, that team got fired, these people are not there. Unless unless it comes from Twitter, you take all of it with a grain of salt because uh, what you're hearing is a lot of people reporting what they think, what they want you to know. And if you don't believe me, those two guys that walked out of Twitter with their cardboard boxes claiming to be Twitter employees and had the media interview them instantly, only to find there were a couple of jokers, should tell you about how that works. Nice. Alex? Yeah. And, and, you know, I think that there's, there's all kinds of possibilities from a financial perspective that don't inc include advertisers. You know, the, the, you know, those blue check marks could easily grow into, I have a membership at Twitter and I may want to follow Nigel to, talking about home improvement or, or adding tech to your thing. And I'll pay maybe not a dollar a month. Maybe I pay Twitter a subscription of you know, as a user, 10 bucks a month or 20 bucks a month. And now I can pick all these up to a certain number of people that I want to follow that are going to be, you know, and they're getting remunerated for that. And Twitter's making some money on that and everything else. And, and I think that, that you could, that Twitter may make more money that way than they did with advertising. I, I work with a lot of creators that live on advertising and it just seems like a hamster wheel. Like it's just, it's just a really painful way to live. John? And that blue check mark has caused us five minutes of discussion during this show That's great, about something it? that you couldn't, you know, that people desired but couldn't achieve. And now anyone could just pay for it. And it totally de incentivizes wanting the blue check mark until six months down the road when we have a black it. check mark. I don't think you, I don't know if you can just pay for it. I think that you, I think that you still go through the process of getting. Approved. I think you get verified, but you, to, to do it, you just need to pay $100 a year. So it's a, it, it demonstrates who's a paying user of Twitter now instead of. But I still think you have to go through the verification process. You know, I mean, I think, I don't think that you can, I think you still have to go through all the process. I think that Twitter should open up a bunch of offices and the initial cost should cost you 500 bucks to be, get a blue check mark. And you should have to go into an office with a passport or, or a license and say, this is me and this is, you know, whatever. And anybody can get that, but they have to prove that they are who they say they are in person with a, with a, with a document and Twitter opens a bunch of things and charges a bunch of money. And then you're right. It would be just that I sort of, I register that I am, I have government IDs that say that I am who I am. Um, and I think that would be fine. You know, I think that it's, you know. Is a blue check mark fungible? Maybe not. <laughs> Let's go to our next question. Well, I put a black ASCII square behind my name. It uh, makes people wonder what on earth is that guy doing? And so we'll leave it at that. Uh, from London, John Clark asks us a two-part question. John says, I want to get into both viewing and working with HDR video. One, what is the go-to large 4K television for viewing in a home setting? And two, what is the go-to studio monitor for producing HDR content in the studio? Okay, Mitchell. 
Yeah, it's no secret. I'm a Sony fanboy. I like Sony products. Uh, so I have a uh, an OLED 4K 90J downstairs for my personal viewing. And it uh, it does make enough uh, uh, image uh, brightness. It's probably like a little under a thousand nits, which is uh, which is pretty darn good for an OLED. I think it's because it concentrates the brightness where it needs to be. So for home use, that works really well. Um, I think also a similarly configured micro LED would be the next step uh, because that's the new technology. So that might be another place to go because that can pump out a lot of brightness, and that's where you really want to be. But uh, for studio use. Um, a professional Sony monitor is going to cost you tens of thousands of dollars. So I don't really know what the other alternative is there. Alex? Yeah, there's there's a couple of them in the in the field. I mean, in, so the, the folks that I work with that do a lot of HDR and recommend a lot of HDR um, work a lot around the LGs. Uh, the L LG OLEDs um, are the ones that are the most popular among folks that are pretty deep into it for home. Um, and uh, those are, I think, the CX, I think it's the CX models. Um, I can't remember. I can I always get the CI and the CX models uh, inverted in my head, but but without looking at, <laughs> without searching for it, those those are the ones um, that we see most often. Uh, as far as uh, color monitors, um, it the lower end, the I mean, the lower cost, the Atomos um, uh, monitors are, are pretty popular in that area, and they'll uh, they'll also be able to read uh, Dolby Vision, and, and a couple of them can. Um, then. What we see a lot are the, I think that are the, I want to say the the Sony at, you know, at, at, at studios, the Sony, I believe they're BVM 310s are the, and they're like $26,000. <laughs> you know, so, so they're, and they have warnings on them that say, hey, these are really bright um, and you may go blind, you know, you, like you, they literally tell you to turn, the, don't look at them for too long, like refer over to these, but don't watch them. So it's a little scary. There is, um, and I, I actually don't know if I can talk about that. So there's there's ones that are coming out that are brighter than, than those ones, but they're not out yet, I don't think. But we'll talk about them when they come out. We're very conscious here in office hours about hearing protection and seeing protection as well. Um, Harshi? I just wanted to clarify on those LG models that always get everyone confused. So like the C10 was called the CX, the C11 which is a 20, 2021 was a C, C1, so C2 would be the 2022 model. So uh, just t that's how they label them. I know all of these companies do these weird labeling things. So just wanted to throw that out there. Alex, something else? Yeah, uh, Flanders Scientific is also a really popular one. It's probably a little less expensive than the Sony's. Um, it's what I believe Charles Klein uses, who does all of our color. And um, so the, they're in the, we, we we often refer to a Charles, you know, there's an Alex, which is $700, but and a 30, and a Mickey that's a $3,200. And a Charles is $11,000 because that's how much his Flanders Scientific um, costs. And uh, what I was going to say is that there is a, I just didn't know when, what was being announced, but there are some 5,000 nit um, coming out. And that's, a, that's half of the 10,000 nits uh, that, that is the entire spectrum of, of HDR. Uh, but again, it would, it's, uh, yeah, that's a lot of, it's a lot of light. It's an arms race between gunner glasses and HDR screens. Mitchell. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I think Alex uh, referred to it, but if you're going to work with those big, bright ones, here's the special music. These are uh, blue blocker uh, uh, glasses from Revo that work really well for cutting down that harmful uh, UV that gets into your eyes, which is bad. And I will say, um, John, I don't have a particular go-to model for televisions, but I, I will recommend the site, rting, R-T-I-N-G-S dot com, ratings is um, the site um, that has different reviews. One word of caution, um, they have all kinds of independent tests as far as you know all the specs and things that they do individually. But one word of caution is if they've tested this particular size of screen, you want to make sure that you're actually getting that particular size and in the region that they've tested because there's all kinds of variations I found out myself. Um, sometimes different sizes of the same television don't necessarily have the same specs as one that could be tested. Let's go to our next question. Bo Cordell from Charleston has our next question. Bo asks, has there been any talk of 16 channel audio within Zoom? Alex? 
Oh, there's been lots of requests. <laughs> so I don't know if there's even any serious talk about it. I think that that's a, it's a pretty niche uh, solution for, for Zoom. And, and the WebRTC protocol in general doesn't really support uh, more than two channels. And so, so it takes a lot. I think the engineering is a little bit more complicated. Um, what we've done in the past when we've needed to move multiple channels like that is we'll use something like uh, uh, Unity Connect and, you, you know, in parallel run it um, out and then rebind it. Um, but we're not doing it directly inside of Zoom because that would be difficult. What do you think, Alex? We have a better chance of getting 4K first or multi-channel audio? Um, I think that I, I think that above 16 channels, I think that 5.1, six channels is probably, or eight channels is probably more likely. It's a lot, there's a bunch of protocols that support eight channels and below. So 16 is supported by SDI, but it's it's a little harder of a protocol to manage. So, um, so I think that eight channels and below, so that'd be... A 5.1 plus 2 would be probably more likely, and I have no information about this. And so there's no, like I'm totally saying this is this would be to make, make the most sense. Um, but I think that it's still a pretty edge case, um, you know, for, for transport, um, you know, for, for Zoom. I wouldn't hold your breath on that one. You might be holding it for a while. We'll see if there's any tea leaves in the upcoming Zoomtopia. Let's go to our next question. Javier Alfaro from Mexico City says, with the... Home theater experience becoming so much better, 4K, HDR, Atmos, and so forth. What still makes you go to the movies? Nigel? So I've sat in some pretty nice home theaters in the last year. I think my favorite was about a half a million dollars. So if you have a half a million dollars free, we can do a, a fairly decent home theater for you. Though we've done one for a million, so that's, that uh, goes a bit further. Uh, my experience is of those that they are a great way to watch any movie. The one reason I might go to the theatre is to be around a few hundred other people. So I think there are certain types of movies. Uh, I can think of, you know, your your Marvel movies, horror movies, if you're into those, where being with physically a bunch of other people changes the nature of the experience. The dividing line typically for me is we have a, one of those theatres that does food. If I don't want to go there because I don't think I'll hear the dialogue and it'll interrupt me, then that would be a great thing to watch at home. If I don't mind being interrupted by someone getting a drink because it's about the action, then I might want the people around me. And Nigel, do you think that um, the size of your typical theater was a calculation based on you know how much they could make per ticket to sell them, or do you think it was more along the lines of the experience in a so theater? I yeah, I mean, I think I think the the problem with the 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 cineplex down the road compared to a good home theater uh, is the quality of sound and video in a good home theater is quantumly better. If you have a really good movie theater, you're really going to get a, a, an experience better than you're going to get almost in any home theater. And when you spend a million dollars on a home theater, it's got 25 seats in it. There are people around, you know, there's a lot of other things. I think the hardest thing for movie theaters is, to, it, other than this stuff being released on, on streaming, is that they don't make a lot of money from showing movies. They make a lot of money from selling concessions and other things. And I think that that means that they're not as worried about the film experience. They're much more worried about the concession experience. Copy. Alex? I realized that when I read that question, I realized I haven't been, I mean, I've been in theaters because I, I, I work in some theaters, but I haven't been to a, as a consumer, I have not been to a movie um, in four years, three years, four years. It's been since I, as a consumer paying for a ticket that I've walked in to see a movie has been three or four years that I, that I did. It was before considerably before COVID and just, I just had, and the only theaters that I will go to are Dolby cinema and IMAX. So that I won't like, I used to go to Arclight if I was in LA, but I'm not going to go to some random movie theater to watch a film because the, because my audio and video at home is better, you know, considerably, you know, I have a pretty good sound surround. My, my neighbors know what I'm watching <laughs> like, you know, when I, when I turn it on. And so, um, so I have a pretty good sound system and a pretty good TV and, and I can make my popcorns better than what I can get in the theater. And I, you know, I um, don't, the, the, the corkage fee isn't very high for me to drink wine while watching with my wife. And so, um, so I think that that's a real challenge. Also, the mixing of the films, so things like Tenet, 
uh, is a different movie when you turn the captions on. <laughs> like it's a different, like when you can actually understand what they're talking, what they're saying. And this this move to moving the dialogue into it has my 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 wife and my daughter would prefer to watch things at home because they can't understand what people are saying in the theater, and so they want the captions on all the time. And so it's uh, it is uh, so that has been. I mean, the sound design has been devastating to. Um, people watching going to movies because they they you know they think that it's really cool and they've done really well with blockbusters but then everybody starts doing it and no one everyone needs captions you know and so um so i think that it's a really interesting problem i um, i think that for me i am going to go see avatar in um the theater um because i'm i want to i'm going to see avatar on in an imax because i know it's going to be an event you know like i know James Cameron has spent a billion dollars on it and it's going to be big and he's going to build it for, he builds these for IMAX and it's going to be this great experience. I, I regret that I was so busy I didn't get to go see Maverick in, in the theater. But those are the probably the two, only the two films this year that I thought, oh, and like Maverick, I was like, oh, I should go see it. And then I was just so busy with production that I didn't get to have the time to go see it. Um, and so, um, so I'm looking forward to Avatar, but there's probably one or two movies a year that I feel like it's necessary that, 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 that it's necessary to see it. And so I think that's a huge challenge for theaters. I think that they need to think of other ways to make money other than films. That's an interesting point, Alex. And maybe I can just pull our panel by a raise of show of hands. How many people have been to the theater in the last week? Three weeks, month, three months. I'm, putting my hand up as illustrative purposes. Three months? Yeah. Uh, six months? I mean, so I if, think you've, that, if I think you've been that, last think, week, you've been in the last six months, so just say. But, 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 yeah. but I think that the thing that's interesting is, is that um, when, we, when we look at when was the last time that we did it, I used to go to a film every week. Like that was like a tradition that I was going to go to some film every, you know, there was going to be a film on the weekend that I was going to go see, you know, and I was looking for which one it was going to be. And the fact that someone like me has moved, and it's not just that I only go to Dolby Cinemas and, and IMAX, there's only four seats I'll sit in, like in the whole theater. Like, and that's part of it is like, I definitely won't go to a theater that you can't like book your seat because I'll look way out in advance. And there's like, you know, it's like 10 E and F in the Dolby Cinema in Metreon and, it's like 35, something or other in the, in the, in Metreon, in the Metreon's IMAX. But that's, those are like the only two seats because that's where all the audio is tuned for, you know, all the audio and video is tuned, you know, it's where you have the primary view of the screen and, and the audio is tuned for that, those seats. And so, um, and so the thing is, is that I think that most people get a pretty, I, I, like, I look at the, like the nosebleeds in the front and I'm like, who would buy that and think that that was okay? Like, like, it's not like, why, why even have those seats there? Like that's, that's where theaters have to get to is like, we're going to charge more. We're going to make a great experience and every seat is a good seat. And they have to stop doing this thing. Like, Hey, we got to pack a bunch of people in for $8 each or for $12 each. I'll pay more money to, you know, I, I think that if you walk out of the theater, you can't walk back in. It's like during the, once the movie starts, like, you know, leaving the theater where I, I work, where I work, if you know, where I used to work um, at Lucasfilm, if you walked out of the stag, you couldn't go back in. Like during the movie, during the movie, you couldn't re-enter. And so everyone managed themselves properly to make sure that that didn't happen. I think rising ticket prices have changed something that could be casually recreational to something that people thought a little harder about the experience they're getting. I think you should have um, good. Mitchell? even harder. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, any place that has large gatherings of people, like it could be a movie theater, it could just as easily be a, a shopping mall, uh, makes me nervous for a variety of reasons. Haven't done either for many years, even before the COVID. Nigel. My only net add to this is there's actually been so little at the theater in the last couple of years designed for the theater that that's the other issue. You know, that I think Hollywood's got out of doing that stuff, except I expect Wakanda forever next weekend will blow all the numbers away. Peter. Well, one of the things I watch is, you know, my, my grandkids' desire to go to the theaters anymore is dropped dramatically. They just as soon watch it on the big screen TV downstairs with the uh, 5.1 and and have easy access to things as opposed to uh, go to the theater. And as Nigel correctly pointed out, very few movies are actually made for that giant that giant screen anymore. 
to take mm -hmm. advantage of it. Very good. Let's go to our next question. Tyler Roberts from Chambersburg says, I'm looking for a recommendation on a KVM solution to control a piece of hardware, a Grass Valley T2 4K from two locations. We'll take USB for the keyboard and mouse and either DVID or HDMI for the monitor. Alex? I don't have a specific one for this um, for this thing, but I will say the first place that I look for anytime I think of KBM is the IHSE. Uh, IHSE.com is the high-end KVM solution. So this is a configurable boxes over many different protocols um, that send all that data back and forth. It's what we've used for things like I need to put a EVS operator, you know, 300 feet from where they where the EVS actually is. This is the, it's super low latency and we need RS-232 and I need a USB and I need a monitor and you can actually slide little pieces into it to make it work. It's not the cheapest solution, but it's a it's a good one. Next question. Bob Sturdivant of Manama, Bahrain asks, what is a super source? Alex? So a super source, and again, it's specific to, we have to understand that like, there, people call these lots of things. Uh, Black Magic calls them a super source. And generally a super source is kind of a DVE on steroids. And so basically you can have two, three, four um, videos and each one of those video, those, those are live videos that are over top or underneath graphics. Um, so that, you know, when you see us, when you see a bunch of us pop up, um, not in the grid, but when there's like three of us that are there, that's a super source. Um, and that's generated by the by black magic. And you can combine super sources, feed one super source into another super source. And so you can end up with more people if, if there's, but usually the switchers only have one or two I mean, well, the Black Magic switchers only have one or two super sources. If you go into Grass Valley and bigger and Sony, you can end up with six or eight of these, you know, that are available to you. It's also where it's why a lot of times we need multiple. When you think about why would you use a four ME switcher and being able to do four edit, you know, four whole buses going through the system. And the reason for that is you maybe want to have one of those MEs feeding the super source um, of one of the windows. So you have like a big window. And you have a little window and the little window might be being cut between hosts talking and the big window might be different news things that they're cutting to. Those are two different MEs feeding that one super source. And so you can embed the MEs or buses into each of those windows. And so that's where things start to, where you start going, I don't, you know, four MEs isn't enough. <laughs> you know, so, uh, you know, and, and some switchers have, um, the most I've seen in one switcher is eight, eight MEs. Although they have, they sometimes can have splits in them that will get them to um, 16. Peter? I was going to ask you, do you want an example? Because I can switch to an example really quickly. Sure. That's there a super go. source. Yeah. That's it's actually two, source, two super sources actually embedded. One is being created by Memo Live, mm -hmm. and that's the one on the left, and that's coming off of the, the uh, Zoom ISO test environment. And then the other one is just the, I just happen to have my, uh, my blank background as a super source feeding it in. So that's the example. So if anyone's trying to figure out what it is, it's just a way of bringing things together. Thanks for illustrating that, Peter. Yeah, sometimes things are branding names, um, composite scenes, I've heard them talk about. But sometimes whenever you mention a specific branding like super source and in the black magic context, they do have greater context than just the, just the composite scenes. Mitchell? Two up, four up, quad split. Used to is the old days uh, of DVE language. Yeah, I think of it as like superscript, you know, where you're having more than one, more than one source. Let's go to our next question. From Douglas Carmichael, Alex, you mentioned LG OLED TVs as having the best HDR. Wouldn't LG TVs be harder to integrate into a larger system? And he noticed uh, Nigel recommended Sony. Uh, I, I was talking about home, home, uh, you know, th those aren't larger systems. The, the, when I gave the LG as an, as an example, it was for home use or for more consumer use. And again, those are the folks that, that I know that do a lot of H HDR work. It's what they, what they get and what they supply to for home use. Um, again, the, the Flanders, the Sony's, um, the Ezios, those are, those are the ones that are going to be, um, uh, more of the production, um, style solutions, but very expensive. So. You guys got to decide what you need. Next question. 
Bo Curdle, Charleston, South Carolina. Has anyone started to see the benefits of Zoom's new high bandwidth mode yet? Alex, got to test yeah, it. We have tested it, and it's been very successful. Um, so it is. Uh, you do have to. You have to go in and ask in support for. Um, you have to ask for the hundred room solution for the meetings um, instead of the fifty. So they have to upgrade you to that. It's just part of how you how, how you get get to that high bandwidth mode. Um, but we have successfully pulled sixteen 1080p uh, outputs um, from uh, two car. You know, two basically. Uh, um, two quad cards, so they're eight out each, going into it from a Mac Studio, both a Mac um, Studio Max as well as the Mac Studio Ultra. Um, I think the Mac Studio, the Max, I mean, sorry, the, the Studio Max, I think is at its upper end of being viable um, at 16 outputs, but the Ultra will do it. Um, you know, I don't know, you know, so I think that there's, it's a real power to have that bandwidth mode there. Um, and uh, so it's, but definitely, I mean, eight you can do now. Uh, well, eight, you needed to go over that because remember that our limit before that, I think, was like 30 megs a second. So you couldn't even do eight. I mean, because eight would be 48. Um, so it, even if you're only doing eight outputs from a Mac Mini, which we've been doing reliably for a while now, uh, you would still need the high bandwidth mode, even though it goes up to 100. It gives you headroom on that eight, and then it gives you 16 um, if you have enough processing power. So we haven't used it in production yet, um, but we are definitely seeing the benefits of it in real time. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that um, that's a service that Zoom is deploying over their servers. And if you need it in a breakout room, you request the BO100. Yeah, the BO100, um, yep. And, uh, and, I don't know. I think. Yeah, the, and, and you need to also, I believe that it's only available to Zoom ISO. Like you have to be a subscribing member of Zoom ISO to get that. Copy that. All right, next question. Douglas Carmichael, if you're wiring a residence with Ethernet, would you stay with two to four Cat6 lines to each room, or would you future-proof with fiber, if the budget permits, as well? Mitchell? I would start with uh, two Cat6, uh, one for primary and one as a backup, but I would also add fiber to future-proof and an RG6, a decent quality RG6 cable. Peter? Well, uh, that's exactly what what Mitchell just described is exactly what I did about five years ago. I've got, I have to, it's RJ6, two of those running to each room, each major room, uh, two Ethernets running to each major room, and two fibers running to each major room, all terminating up in actually in my upstairs laundry room, to be quite honest. Uh, and then I can move them around. But that's, you know, it's easy to do when you have the wall open. Do it. <laughs> Even better, if you're building the house, do it while the before the walls are closed up, and mm -hmm. just put them in there, um, and then you'll be fine. And you know, I was to, I was actually pleasantly surprised when I realized I could take that RG6. I had to do some funky things with the patch panel in the laundry room, but I can put my bird dog downstairs, make it the RG6 with a right cable adapter, make it think it's an SDI cable, and and run it upstairs. All right, thank you. So it depends. Next question. Hershey Trivetti from Daytona Beach, Florida says, how do you find your center point in theaters as you shared previously, or rather tuned for the seats? Alex? I have the advantage of having worked with a bunch of folks that know where those are, those seats are. <laughs> so so that's, that's so it, it tends to be the middle of most theaters and then the back, uh, it's about three rows from the back on, on the IMAX theater, three or four rows back from the IMAX theater are probably better viewing um, and, and, and hearing the, um, the, with the, what you, the rule of thumb is on a regular theater, not an IMAX theater, but a regular theater is that you count the speakers along the side and you either, if there's an even number of speakers, you sit between the, the middle ones. And if there's an odd number, you sit on the row that has the middle speaker into it. So you're sitting right in that middle area. Then you walk over and you find the vector that goes straight from the, from the projector to the screen, which will be right down the center, not sometimes the center of the room, but the center of the screen. And those two seats on that row there, the two seats below, in front of them, the two seats, or the four seats in the center, and then the four seats below, front and back are, are going to be the the, you know, the 12 seats that are worth sitting in. And um, I will only book those seats in the, the, the very center perfect seat. Um, uh, I sit a little bit for, further forward in the Dolby 
cinema in the metro because there's no seats in front of me. <laughs> it's so close. It's one, it's one, it's within one row and it's, and I get to sit with nobody in front of me in front of the screen. It's a great, it's a great viewing angle. Nice. Next question. Bob Sturdivant from Manama, Bahrain asks, why is there such a price difference in the Calibrate color checker passport photo and the video version? He wants to know, can I use my photo one for video? Alex? Uh, you'll get most of the same benefits from the photo versus the video. I believe the video is more calibrated. So it's actually, there's extra rounds of making sure that every single color is very specific because it works in it. And it, the passport worked fairly well. The video version will is more calibrated than the passport, so the, the the known qualities are higher. You know, it's just they throw more of them away. I mean, that's really what happens. They print them out and they throw more of them away to get to the video ones um, than they do with the, the photo ones. And and it will. It's for when you're doing automatic processing of video. It's really important that those colors are accurate. Next question, Douglas Carmichael. Would there be any caveats when using commercial dumb displays like the Sony commercial Bravia range, and he gives us a web link for that, in a residential setting? Could they be mounted on consumer TV mounts? Nigel? Yeah, I think most of them take visa mounts. So you can probably use them in that environment. Um, I, I don't know why you would, though. I'm not sure what the upside is. They, they will be more expensive. Uh, they'll be more expensive because the people like who resell them need to make a margin on them. They don't get much of a margin on reselling, you know, consumer-based televisions. They may have different warranty specs. They will have different parts in them, although it's hard to know whether those parts are in the other televisions that are not turned on. But, like, you'll find some of them have 16 gig of memory because they're being used for display systems. Or they'll have other features. They may have some different networking or wireless or Wi-Fi connections because of the way they're going to be used. But, but they'll probably pretty much the same television without some of the uh, more consumer software. Oh, and by the way, the other thing is the really good ones are probably exactly the same panels that have passed more tests and cleared more quality control than the ones I'll sell you as a consumer. Well put, Nigel. Let's go to our next question. Nathan Cashon of Oregon City asks, does Zoom offer nonprofit discounts? The only thing I could find was through TechSoup, which requires paying $57 to get $75 off the annual meeting plan. A dollar fifty a month discount isn't even worth the effort. And we'll answer briefly. Peter? Short answer is no. Alex? I believe that you have to reach out. You should reach out to a to Zoom directly. I believe it's actually up to fifty percent off, depending on the nonprofit. Um, but I think that you have to reach out to them directly. I, I don't think it's it's well published on their site. Next question. Next question comes from Serge Blunden in Montreal. He asks, "How does the panel feel regarding OLED with burn-in possibilities versus the new micro LED?" Nigel. I am bitter about OLED. We had a very nice LG OLED television got left on CNBC most of the time. And when you uh, turned it off or when you turned it on, the uh, ticker was there forever. And so I tend to avoid uh, things like that where I have to manage the device to that level of use. And so I don't know, the, you know, the technical difference between those two types. I know I just won't buy an OLED again. And Mitchell? Just make sure when you buy the TV that you see that it has the ability to move those pixels a little bit uh, to avoid that burn-in issue. Uh, the Sony has a uh, X1 processor, which does all kinds of stuff in the background to keep that from happening. And our final question. James Haldane from Vancouver, Canada asks, does the ATEM SDI seem more stable than the ATEM HDMI models? Go ahead, Nigel. Sorry, we, Alex. Yeah, yeah. So the um, uh, yeah, I uh, uh, I don't know if it's more stable. It's definitely more capable. It's got four four SDI outputs um, because it's got it's able to run in a more dense fashion. Um, I, it definitely feels more stable, but I don't know. I don't have any empirical data for that. Uh, I have both the Mini Extreme ISO and the SDI version of it, and the SDI version is much heavier too, <laughs> like than, than the than the HDMI version. Um, but uh, I it has me very much thinking about going back to an SDI workflow because. Uh, it is, um, you know, it just works, you know, and it has the four four outputs is when you're used to the extreme is life changing. Like, it's just really nice to have that that extra data, the extra outputs. 
Well, thank you very much for our panel for providing those questions. Thank you to our producers for producing those questions, for asking them into Mukana, and especially our, um, our back end crew. We uh, won't have our credits until the end of the show, but you'll get to see just who's been doing uh, some of the heavy lifting for our show. Our show's not over. Uh, we see our education folks have been filing in, so we're anticipating that. John, uh, what do you have for us today? Thanks, Josh. During Education Hour, after a short break, we'll be continuing the grand office hour tradition of ruthless reviews. But this time, instead of critiquing each other's sound or video, we'll take a look at some slide deck examples and offer suggestions for improvement. We're calling them ruthless redos. Hope we'll see you guys in a, after a short break.
seconds. Our timer will be at 53 minutes for our launch. Have a good show. Good morning and welcome back. We have a superb panel of educators today. And based on the conversation we had in Discord earlier this week, it should be a very informative hour. We'd love to hear your questions and comments in Mukana chat. In fact, as producers, you drive the show with your questions and your votes. Sort of like a choose your own adventure book from the 80s. While our producers are considering where they'll lead us today, I'd love it if our panel could start with a general discussion about how we approach developing and improving our slides. After that, I'll show a quick before and after example of a slide deck that I worked with Laura to improve, and then we'll see where our panel or where our producers take us. So, Aaron, what? Uh, how do you improve slides? So, good morning, John. I love using slides in my classroom. I use Google Slides because that's what my school has. So, I actually have transformed my daily lessons into slides. So one way that I keep everything moving along is a couple of things. First, I try not to put a whole lot of text on the slide. If I do, it's more of like an example. Like this week we were working on letter writing. I had to show an entire letter from beginning to end. So in that case, we needed a lot of text, but it was more to show the pals the setup of the letter versus them reading the text for the content. Another way that I love to use my slides is to incorporate a timer into as many slides as I can. Just pulling it off of YouTube or one that my husband made me um, makes it really quick and easy for students to see how much time they have left on different activities. And then keeping the animation, if I do any, incredibly simple because Sometimes if the internet is a little bit laggy or if my Chromebook is acting a little funky, animation can slow it down a bit. So overall, less words, the better, timers and less animation. So it sounds like you're using it a little bit as classroom management as well as um, lesson aid. And can you remind us of what age you're using that with primarily? Absolutely. I use this with third graders, so eight and nine year olds. Great. Uh, I would say when I'm thinking about slides, I'm primarily teaching adults in a corporate setting. And my approach is, what's the purpose of the slide? Like, what does the slide do in the lesson plan? And every slide needs to earn its place. But I know Dr. Clark has some interesting suggestions as well. Dr. Clark? Oh, that was quick, John. Uh, the way I use slides has evolved. Um, as I said last week, uh, starting with um, overhead projector slides in the uh, ancient days, in the previous century. But um, now, again, with adults, similar to John, um, but I usually use uh, PowerPoint or Keynote as a, uh, as a device to create one image, one slide that uh, illustrates a relationship between uh, ideas or processes. I've used it with, I was treasurer of a church for a while and used it to show how the, how the resources and the budget flow together, the resources come together to, to make a budget for the congregational meeting. And uh, I've used it to show uh, the relationship between elements of a theory of learning. So that's one of the, one of the uh, subject matters that I taught when I was active as a, an educational psychologist. And now, one thing I found very helpful is um, I have access to a, uh, a huge slide deck, hundreds of templates by uh, Duarte Diagrams. Um, and I, I searched through that to find the beginnings of a way of representing 
processes or changes over time and so forth. They have hundreds and hundreds of beautiful examples. Uh, and I find one that kind of matches what I have in mind and then uh, label that to suit the situation. So I uh, stand on the shoulders of giants. Instead of starting with a blank screen, uh, I don't have the, I haven't developed the background or the skill of using all those tiny menu items that John, uh, John occasionally flashes on our screen here. Um, so I like to start with what Duarte diagrams genius people uh, have created and then modify that to suit my situation. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. I was today, today years old when I knew that Duarte had templates. <laughs> so, so, so like, I just, I was like, Chris, I just heard Chris, when Chris said Duarte, I used Duarte templates. I was like, they make templates. So, um, so uh, Duarte, for those of you who don't know, build some of the highest end uh, presentations uh, in the, in the, in the world. And, um, and so the, the fact that they, I, I mostly see them working at events. So if I'm working at an event, and a company has the resources to bring Duarte and they bring this team in of Duarte, from Duarte, it'll be eight or 10 people. And they sit there and they did one, of, they took one of my presentations for um, WWDC. It was the best presentation I'd ever made. And then they just tore it apart and put it back together. And then it was the best presentation I've ever made. <laughs> so it was, it was like 10 X from what I did. And um, it, it was, it was, I mean, it was like watching a great quarterback or something, you know, just sit there suddenly, you know, like I'd been playing high school ball and I thought oh, I was pretty good in high school. And then, and then, you know, um, and then I got to see what Patrick Mahomes does with my presentation. And so, um, so anyway, uh, amazing, amazing. I'm, I'm now here, like looking, looking at the templates. So anyway, the great suggestion. I also Googled Duarte templates. I think it's a totally valid choice to uh, stand on the shoulder of giants or just on the step stool of some canned uh, slide template elsewhere and make it your best. It's really a question of um, how much time do you want to invest in customizing it? And I know some of our Mukana chat questions are about designing, so we'll get to those momentarily. Uh, one more time, back to Alex. Yeah, the one thing I will say is that one of the things that's great about um, opening up templates, I use a lot of, uh, I mean, I, I'm now going to be using Duarte. I, I zoom, there's a uh, Keynote Topia, I think, that also has a lot of great templates. And then I use a company um, for, in Motion, I use a, a company called Motion VFX, and they just have Motion documents of these incredibly beautiful images that I use for visual effect, I mean, for visuals, you know, not, not for a presentation. But what's interesting about it is you learn a lot. Like when you when you open up a deck that has been built by someone who really is good at what they do, you can learn a lot about how to build your own presentations. Absolutely. Always learn every chance you get, including watching other people's work. We call it research in academia and uh, copyright infringement in the rest of the world. I'm going to next show uh, an example of a slide deck that I helped improve recently, and you saw it here in Education Hour a few weeks ago. And I want to talk through my process that I worked with Laura Thompson to help get her deck where she wanted it to be. So when we were preparing for our discussion about uh, the transitions to the workforce for special education, Laura had some really great data that she wanted to help people understand the data better. And so she came to me with this slide that you can see in front of you right now. And she said, how do I make this so people can understand it? What? And I started, I sat down with Laura, we spent probably an hour the first time. And I started with the question, what from looking at the data yourself, you're the expert, Laura, what's the message that you want your learners to hear by looking at these slides? And so we looked at it and she had basically these four slides that were bar charts. Um, and it was a bar chart laid over the top of a bar chart, as you can see, based on the different per education levels. And she said, well, when I was doing the research, there was like really two key insights that stuck out to me. And the first insight was the difference between someone who's um, not disabled and their employment level, even if they don't have a high school diploma, compared to the employment level of a disabled person with a college degree. That was one data point she really wanted to highlight. And so when we looked at her original slide deck, one, th those two data points weren't compared. But also when we looked at it, there's a lot of information we see on, this, on the screen and a lot of numbers and a lot of people think if I show many numbers, it shows how much research I've done and how hard my work is. And I, and I don't think that's the case for Laura, but people equate information density with information communication. 
And that's not the case. So I, I asked her about this particular slide and I said, what are these colors indicating first? Like, what are we tr trying to show? And the blue one was a comparison between the people without a disability and with a disability, um, just the percentage of the total population that's achieved this education level. The red bar was the employment rates of that same population. And I said, well, is that the same conversation or are those two separate conversations? And they were two separate conversations. So we started with, okay, we want to compare two populations. So we want a side by side like this. And um, there are some alignment issues as well. So I, I took that and then my first um, solution was, let's take the exact same slide and I'll just um, preview my animations here. So she has uh, them swipe in from the bottom and you can see that as you um, watch those wipes, they come all the way from below the screen. They're not masked at all. So every object comes from off the screen onto the screen. Very first thing I did was I just aligned the objects to make sure everything lined up perfectly. And then I put one or two masks on so that they look like they're growing from the middle of the screen instead of coming from off screen. And that just adds a slight tiny bit of polish. And we looked at that and said, okay, now at least it looks like it's um, the slide itself is structured instead of having stuff flying around. But we're also going to share this in, in office hours. And we know that office hours, you don't want to share a bright screen, a white background, if you're sharing through something that's not a projector. Like if you're using a television screen, typically you want to use a darker background because the brightness of a, an LCD screen is so bright it can hurt your, your user's eyes, especially when we talk about things like HDR. So our next stage was how do we take the same information and communicate in a, in a prettier way the information? And so we said, let's use icons instead of bars. And Laura had the idea of to show the percentage, we can just fill these icons up. So we took some icons from the PowerPoint library, added a light gray background, and that's just to make it less harsh on our eyes. And um, now you can easily see that the icon represents sec some two-year degree or vocational school because of the icon we chose. And secondly, you can instantly see the difference because of the fill level on the two icons. So that captured the idea. And so what we started with is what's the message? And then how do we communicate the idea before we worry about colors, before we worry about uh, animations, before any of that stuff, you need to have the structure in place. But that still didn't show us how to compare the different education levels. And one thing we considered was, well, if we compared because the population is broken into the different education levels and we could use pie charts. Pie charts are great visualization if you have a whole population and you want to see how it's split up. But two pie charts side by side are hard for people to read. So if you ever have to compare two populations and they equal 100%, generally you want to use a butterfly chart instead because it gives you the same easy to compare. I can quickly compare the size of these bars. And so we started with just standard PowerPoint colors and said, can we visualize this a little simpler and easier than having two bar charts where you're trying to compare colors between the two and you have to manage them to make sure they're all equal? And we just use a simple butterfly chart. And once we got to this point where we had our icons as the primary source and then the uh, population comparison as a the secondary, then we started worrying about what it looked like. And for example, uh, we had white text versus black text on here, so that was legible. It was hard for people to read when we were in after hours. The light gray was not dark enough for people in after hours. And the color scheme, I mean, it looks like we're either trying to be Google or we're just being really uh, elementary. And what we decided to do, do next was choose our colors. And I just went online and I just searched for dark color schemes. There's a really great Mac app called Pika, P-I-K-K-A, -K -K -A, um, that you can also create your own color palettes with and there's libraries and you can save them. But I just found a picture I liked on the internet with the colors I wanted to use. I brought this into PowerPoint and I used my eyedropper to just change those same colors on my slides. And so now we have a very nice dark background with a really a lot of contrast on each of the items. Um, the one contrast we're still struggling with I think is on this blue bar. And so that's one place I would think of changing it. And we have a dark blue background with light gray text so it's not like a standard template. Uh, that was our decision making in this process is we wanted it to look custom to our purpose, easy to read and pretty. And then last week we did the icon thing and the very last stage was to add the animations. And we talked about animations last week, but we had these animations wipe in and then have a teeter effect at the end just to give a little bit of life to them. 
And then on our first slide, we have these pop in, so they'll pop in, grow, shrink really quick, uh, one after the other. So it feels a little bit random, although it doesn't look very nice uh, through Zoom, I would say, because of the frame rate issue. So I would consider doing that differently if I was to do this again. But that was our approach to making this uh, an improved slide deck. And if any of the panelists have other um, slides that they would like to share, we can certainly do that. But I wanted to show how I think about this is I think first, what am I trying to communicate? And then what's the visual that will best allow me to do that? And then the last thing is, how do I make it pretty? So that's one approach to updating slides. But let's go ahead and go into our producer questions. Gudrun, what's our first question? Our first question comes from Bob Sturdivant from Manoma Bahrain. In PowerPoint, is there a way to insert multiple cameo objects with different video sources or a source change between slides? I, I think I can answer that question. In my very limited experimentation, you can have multiple cameo objects on the same slide, but they can only have one video source that I was able to do. Every time I would try to change video source between my two objects, both objects would change. So I don't know any situation where you'd want two of the same video feed on the same slide, um, but you couldn't do it that way. I did not try, um, and we can try that if we have a little extra time today, I didn't try to do a separate source on two separate slides. The way that when I changed the source, it changed everything, my suspicion is probably not. Um, what you can do is you can also you can bring in a separate video feed from an external source as a video object that's not a Cameo. Cameo, I believe, is specific to the, um, the web camera that's connected to your computer. But if you have a video source like on the internet, you should be able to bring that in as a stream. I've not tried that, um, so your mileage may vary. What's our next question? Our next question comes from Nathan Cashin in Oregon City. Does anyone have or know of a checklist for creating custom themes in Keynote that will help make sure I don't miss all of the elements that I can't even remember to think of? You might have stumped us, Nathan. <laughs> um, I know that I typically start with a, a theme I like, and then I make small changes from there. Uh, I think if you think about the key aspects to a theme you want to think about is you want a consistent shape style, including the color fill, the outline, and the opacity of colors. Um, other key things you want to think about are uh, consistent background or backgrounds, uh, your, your font or type styles you want to think through, especially your H1s versus your H2s. Uh, and then lastly, I would think about what are my core layouts I'm going to be using all the time. Uh, you're going to want definitely a slide layout that has a, a title um, text item, as well as uh, probably something that can have a single media object in it, as well as a side by side media and text. Uh, honestly, my slide decks are simple enough that I rarely have to think about that. But I would take it like one step at a time. And when you see something missing, you save your template. Alex, what are your thoughts? One thing that I do is I, with text, I, I make sure that I'm using styles. So I assign styles to things all the time and I make sure that the, this text is my, and if I don't like it, I go change it. I change what that style is and I update it with what I'm doing um, so that um, it makes it easier for me later if I want to go, I want to change all the headers to this or all this to this, all this to this. Um, if you get into editing the style, I don't edit anything through directly to the text. I make it always make sure that I abstract it to the style to make sure that I can make those adjustments all the way across all the slides as needed. So um, so that's one thing that I focus on. A lot of times, I again, like John, I don't build very, ones that are very complicated. So it's usually pretty easy. Um, I find <laughs> that I uh, finish the template. I finish the document. I usually start with something very simple like John. I finish the document and then I make a decision of, I feel like it should look like this and I'll go through and adjust how things, everything looks. Oh, I want rounded corners or I want this kind of look. And, but I oftentimes do that as a final pass as opposed to an initial pass because it, it tells the story better, you know, when I'm, when I'm working through it. And it's also when I'm building those animations, I decide, okay, this kind of information is going to swing in from this side. This kind of information is going to swing in from this side. This subtler information is going to, you know, do the appear and disappear, but, um, and then I don't use any of the kooky ones, you know, like, a, but I have, but I use a lot of, um, I do use uh, a lot of magic 
so I, this is not in PowerPoint, <laughs> sorry, but in, 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 in Keynote, I use a lot of magic um, transitions that fly in and fly out. Yeah, magic move and morph is a whole separate second hour we'll do in the future, I am sure. Yeah. Um, with those styles, I will just add really quickly, that is the number one way I can tell somebody is a professional, is whether or not they use styles, not just in PowerPoint or Keynote, but in Word documents, in uh, Excel formats. It shows that you think through the whole picture and you're thinking about your object as a whole instead of um, cause otherwise you're going to, you're going to miss changing a font size or a bold or something like that at some point, if you don't use styles, Aaron. Again, to not, sorry, I don't use PowerPoint, but for Google slides, I keep the same templates. I make an original of everything I want. And I really think about that, which slides I want timers on, which slides I want, you know, bold words on things like that. And then a lot of times it doesn't change day to day but the information I put into it changes. So my slides run Monday through Friday and I put in our schedule. So, you know, my morning meeting slide is first and I ha if I have a video I'm linking, I link it right there. But what I do is I make first what I need in the schedule, then I make it fancy, and then I just make copies of it for every week so that I never miss an element that I need. And if I don't need that element that week, I can always go back to the original and copy it from there. That way I don't lose anything or miss anything. Great ideas. Next question, Gundren. Next question comes from Chris Clark in Tempe. Has anyone had students create slides as a medium for their own learning as well as for their presentations? Go ahead, Chris. Well, I put my hand up because no one else had put their hand up yet. And I didn't want the opportunity to pass on commented on but let me pass pass the baton to the next uh, panelist and then maybe i'll have a something to say at the end all right how about aaron so absolutely i like having students create slides um one of the big things i did over the summer is i got to go to california i got to go to laguna beach and we did um, I went to a seminar called Edu Protocols, and they use a lot of slides, um, keynotes, PowerPoints to do a lot of their lesson framings. So instead of doing a Venn diagram for compare and contrast, they have a special name for it. But it's a lot about how you send out slide decks to kids that you don't have to put a lot of energy into as the teacher. It's a lot about the student creating things. So one of their really cool ones was called Iron Chef. So you would give them a topic and the template is the same for every student. So all you have to do is copy it and change the first slide in the deck. And it would say, um, like I would post a link for a video and I would say, first, you're gonna watch this video. It's a source that everybody will get. Then you have to write five facts about, or type five facts from the video. Then you have to find a picture that represents what you just watched. And then there's a secret ingredient, just like the Iron Chef show. Like one I did on weather this week was all the different types of severe weather. And I said, what's your favorite kind of weather? That's the secret ingredient. So that way, when I presented it to the class, everybody had something a little bit different. The facts were different on most of the slides so that the students really got a full view of the video and thought and got to share and collaborate with their other peers. Thanks. And Alex? Yeah, I actually think that this, um, in the modern day, a skill set of building uh, slide decks is probably more important than a skill deck of, of building like papers, like writing a paper. Um, you know, people at what, in the corporations that I work in or that I consult with, uh, everything's run on a deck. You know, there's very few times where you see actual papers written because no one reads them. You know, so so the uh, so the it's really important now for students when I've worked with them, I push them to definitely build describe their things with with slide decks. I also push them to make videos with their slide decks. And so that's a really powerful thing to do is to learn how to use whether it's Keynote or, or, or um, uh, PowerPoint is to learn how to put together a video because it's a lot easier to build the animations into all the infographics and everything else in your your presentation software than it is in 
Motion or Final Cut or Premiere or anything else, and you can throw all those ideas together. Especially now that you have video that you can you can add of you talking about something and everything else. You can build something that's very powerful, very quickly inside of these. And so pushing them to build videos of that using their 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 tools, um, the the presentation tools is is I think really useful. Harshi. So what I found really interesting this week. Uh, I was working on a product uh, or audio equipment and how do you present something to someone that might be easier to read? And so I went down this, uh, let me go to slides dot, uh, whatnot on Google. I ran into a kind of a brick wall with accessibility there. So went down towards PowerPoint, but it's, it's a really great tool. I think, you know, for any kind of information to present to somebody, because in my head, I'm thinking, okay, a uh, bunch of microphones or interfaces we we're talking about. So I could list a bunch of interfaces and be more clear, say, these are the five interfaces I want to talk to you about. And then on each slide is each interface with the web website and, you know, a picture if, if necessary and all of that information. And structurally in my brain, the design was much more fluent in a PowerPoint method, I would think, or a slides, depending on, or even a keynote. But sometimes you do also have to choose what you may or may not be more comfortable with, you know, as far as software and that learning process that comes in that, in that, you know, you might want to have to learn Google's products rather than Microsoft products. So sometimes there's that decision making between where it might take you an extra week where you're getting more comfortable with either way of uh, products. So there's that effect too. Thanks, Arshid. How about Dr. Clark? Wonderful, wonderful contributions, very helpful. Um, what I'm trying to do with this question in a way is um, pivot a little bit from uh, PowerPoint or other slide programs as a presentation device to um, PowerPoint and visual inf representation of, of what's in my head, what's in my mind as a learning tool. And, and it's my experience that when students actually uh, organize and express uh, what their understanding is of something, that they learn it more deeply, that they clarify uh, the, the points about which they're uncertain. Uh, we, we tend to give ourselves the benefit of the doubt. Oh, I, know, I understand that. I've had experience with that. Um, until we're asked to teach it to someone else. And one of the great uh, insights that people can have is that you learn something much more deeply if you try to organize what you think you know in a way that communicates to someone else. So the tutor learns more than the 2T. And, and making a PowerPoint slide or a keynote slide that shows your understanding, especially comparing it with the understanding of your classmates, that we each have different ways of understanding things uh, from the common experience of reading a, a chapter or hearing a lecture. Um, everybody in, in range uh, creates a different mental picture based on their background experience and their, their own uh, blind spots as well as their strengths. So. Uh, so my pitch is that we should experiment more with thinking about slides as as learning uh, aids, as well as as uh, presentation aids. Thank you. Could not have said it better myself. Thank you, Dr. Clark. Next question. Nathan Cashin from Oregon City asks: Textbook publishers will often provide a PowerPoint for each chapter but they are unusable in my experience. Horrible, text-heavy slides. What are some favorite efficient ways to redesign these decks? Thank you so much, Nathan, for that question. And I have an example of exactly what you're talking about that I think we can talk through together. And I think one thing that happens is when you're building education materials, it's really easy just to take the shortcut of, let me just put everything in on one slide instead of thinking through what do you need. 
And so um, also Adam Mitchell's in the chat earlier said, one great thing about PowerPoint is you can have multiple different slide masters and themes. And you can actually see that here as we went from this dark theme into uh, a corporate theme of a company I work for. <coughs> and uh, these are some actual slide decks that we use in our training programs. And I would like to look at this one in particular. And I'm curious, panel, um, this is a training that I lead about HIPAA, which is the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. And it's done primarily through instructor-led teaching. So you're in a classroom and you have to say certain parts, you have to explain and express certain parts of the law. And so you end up with these really text-heavy slides. And believe it or not, this is one of the least text-heavy slides in this deck. Um, but I'm curious, how would you handle this particular slide if you were teaching this or if you're trying to edit it and we need to talk about in HIPAA the minimum necessary standard, which is the rule of thumb for minimum necessary standard is if you need to access information for your job, you have permission to do that. And you should only share the minimum necessary to get the job done. So how can we communicate this legalese into that message? Any thoughts? Go ahead, Aaron. The only thing that I'm thinking when I'm looking at this slide is if there's a way to break it into two slides, because then there would be less text on the screen, even though they need to read it. Um, maybe each of the bullet points has their own slide. That way they have to read it anyway. They might as well not be flooded with information, even though this isn't as flooded as some other slides I've seen. So you're saying do something kind of like this. And now it's not it's not going to be pretty by any means. But if I break this into two separate sub slides and then um, one thing that's interesting is we do have styles here. So we have the titles, the largest text, and that's on purpose. I want this to be the, the most important thing on this particular slide is the word phrase minimum necessary because it's kind of self-defining. Uh, Dr. Clark. The slide content reminds me of. Uh something I learned in the military, which is the principle of need to know. So, and I think a lot of people recognize those words. So it might, it might be, um, if, if you agree that that's the underlying principle that need needing to know is really the basis on which people are included or excluded with regard to access then I think that's more memorable. And then if you're required by law to actually give the, the language of the, of the legislation or the regulation, then you can, you can provide that certainly. But what people will remember is need to know. So I would use that. That's a really good point. And you could actually, I, I was thinking maybe put it as a sub point, but reasonably limits who has access to PH, PHI's uh, protected health information. It's defined earlier. Based on certain conditions, uh, that could actually all be removed. You are 100% right, Dr. Clark. And you could just say, do I need this to do my job? And then, I, I just like the need to know language because it's it's well established out there in the world. And uh, right. Anyway, that's my gift to you. And I think the other other part of it is sh like the minimum sharing, like um, how little can I share or something like that. And honestly, that pretty much that does not apply to uses disclosures when authorized by the patient provider requests. Um, this is really saying sometimes I can share more. And then I can say, uh, instead of disclosures authorized by the patient, when patient asks me to, when doctor decides to, or a other occasional legal times. I, I would clear that up a little bit. But, you know, instead of being legalese, now we're just talking about what do you need for the job? And, and sometimes it's as simple as thinking through, like, 
what's the message I need to send to my audience? And these, the audience here is a bunch of call center representatives. They're not doctors. So how do I describe this in a way that they understand? Uh, since we don't have any other comments on this particular slide, uh, maybe we can come back into it later, but I do wanna make sure we get back to our producer questions. What's our next question? Next. It. Next question is from Douglas Carmichael. With live video input in Keynote, how could you see yourself using it to make your decks more interesting? Alex? Yeah, on the decks that I've used so far when I've done it, there's a little bit of sync issue, so you have to kind of think about how you're going to use it, but I'm using it in conjunction with a switcher. So what's nice about it is, is it gives you that picture in picture. It also, um, one of the things that I've been experimenting with is using these little these little cameras here. So this is the um, Insta360 link and hanging it and then having it over top of something I'm trying to describe and then being able to have that pop in. So I'm sitting there talking about like, here's how this product works. Now let me show you. And, and instead of having to go out somewhere in the past, I've used the switcher to do that. But now in context, I can still be talking to you a little picture in picture over on one side, but I now have this close up here and I, and I can even, if I've planned it out well, I can have little call outs pop over top of it and I or I do that before that and then switch to, to the live one where I'm turning the knobs and moving things around and so it's it's pretty awesome <laughs> like it's it's a you know combined especially with good a good set of webcams um, you know uh, I'm, I've uh, gotten up to three so far into into keynote uh, three different webcams that are showing different things that I want to show um, in live feeds that have been pretty useful great go ahead Aaron what I think could have been useful for me is if I used my daily slides from Google Slides, put them into Keynote, and then when I felt better um, after having COVID, having my student teacher put up my slides and then have me be picture in picture at home, describing and teaching on top of the slides. I think that would have been helpful for the students as well as my student teacher. <laughs> awesome. What's our next question? Our next question is from Bob Sturdivant from Manoma Bahrain. Is there a way to automate copying, inserting text notes file into the PowerPoint notes area, but across the slide deck? Note one or paragraph one on slide one notes to note two in sli into slide two notes, etc. I don't know of a way to do that, and it doesn't look like our panel does either. I will look into this, Bob, because I can see that being really helpful. I almost wonder if it would be a function of importing uh, an outline, because both PowerPoint and Keynote can import outlines, and based off of the structure of the outline, uh, categorize text into different parts of the field. Aaron? I'm hoping that I'm interpreting this incorrectly, but in Google Slides, when I present something um, I'm able to see any speaker notes, so I'm able to see them on the side and see the slide that I'm presenting at the same time so that if I needed to say something specific or move something around, I'm able to do that in Google Slides. I'm not sure if that's exactly what the question was asking, but that's how I interpreted it. Well, thank you very much. What's our next question? Tony Mobley from Noon and here from the channel asks, is there an opportunity to suggest basic PowerPoint training sources for younger students or older adults? Go ahead, Alex. I don't know about training resources. Um, I do think that there are, I mean, some basic things that I tell people, and so it's not really training resources, but, you know, use sans serif, uh, limit yourself to 20 words per slide. <laughs> you know, like, you know, like the, these are really simple things that I start to, you know, um, dark if you're going to do presentation, white if you're going to print it. Um, and try to use images as much as possible to make that work. I find that that handles like literally 80% of the problems that I see on slides. <laughs> like it's just, just a handful of things that you need to do. Um, and, then, and then after that though, I don't know of any other um, specific training areas. How do you approach it, Aaron? I do basic step-by-step -step instruction with the kids. First, I do very direct instruction, like let's look for the insert button and then insert a picture and things like that. But if you start off with a low cognitive load when teaching it, like something fun, regardless of the age level, they're more likely to be involved and excited to try it versus jumping in with something content heavy right away. Um, I know there was a really cool slide deck that I saw 
um, about SpongeBob. And it was using the the Freyer model. So having like a quote from the character, what the character looks like, um, things that the character likes. And then there was one more I forgot. But having the students start out with something silly like that helps them know how to do things in certain orders. So I think if you can keep the cognitive load low and let them kind of explore and kind of um, to steal Emily's phrase to push buttons and break things, um, just let them try. The worst that's going to happen is they're going to delete the slide deck. Yeah, I really appreciate that approach. My kids both love playing with PowerPoint um, in their free time. And so I just put them on my computer and let them build the deck they want. It's usually pretty terrible. And then they'll ask me, how do I make this happen? So maybe they want to make a little cartoon. And so I use that as an opportunity to show them how to use the morph transition is put your guy where you want on one slide, put him where you want on the second slide and morph between them or magic move and keynote and just give them an opportunity to make what they want to make. Uh, especially at the younger ages. And then as people get older, what I like to do is if they see a slide deck they like, ask for a copy of it and dissect it. Look at the animation pane, look at the selection pane and learn how something you like works, um, disassemble it. And then after that, try to build it yourself. What's our next question? You sound like you're muted, Gundrum. I'm sorry. Next question comes from Tony Mobley in Union, Georgia. Since most people in the world are on Android phones, is it possible to do quality Google Slides on the phone? And he refers to MobiLearn has Mukajar. Go ahead, Alex. Uh, the other thing to remember is that you can use things like Squarespace to build entire documents uh, that are web-based and dynamic. So uh, you can build a slide deck that looks a certain way, but we've built entire training manuals inside of Squarespace because we had to get to lots of different people all over the world with lots of formats. And it was easier to send them a web link to something that looks fairly well designed, but that it'll dynamically change based on their format and based on everything that they're looking at. Um, we found that to be more effective than using um, Google Slides, which we tried. <laughs> Aaron? I would say using Google Slides, it's you really can't make them on the phone. But if you were in a situation where you didn't have your other devices, you weren't able to share um, somewhere else and you had to present maybe to like a small group, it could work. Or if you could share it to a larger device like a smart board or Promethean board, that would be one thing. But editing them at all on the phone is not recommended. Aaron, have you ever used like any of like the meme generators or like the Canva type tools to uh, do something in, on a mobile device and then import that into Google Slides by chance? I don't. I've used I've made a couple of things in Canva, like um, like certain slides or like a certain um, text, but that's about it. I haven't done a whole lot in terms of that just because um, I kind of forgot about Canva for a while. Uh, but now that I'm kind of poking back into it um, with actually the help of Erica, um, I might be trying some of that in the near future. Thanks. I, I feel like there's a lot of tools that are mobile specific to make neat things to be read on mobile devices, whether it's the canvas of the world or, um, you know, the Apple little clips app to video things or TikTok. And I feel like there's something there. And that's probably where I would start if I'm thinking mobile first, because the interface for Google Slides, PowerPoint online, Keynote um, online are all uh, significantly harder to do on a mobile device. But uh, your mileage may vary. What's our next question, Gudrun? Our next question is from Douglas Carmichael. John, I like how you used, you used your icons in a descriptive way. Wouldn't you want to simplify the design of set icons when used as a central element so as to decrease cognitive load on the viewer? Yeah, I, I did use icons specifically to decrease the total cognitive load. And they were a little bit complex icons. And to me, it's, it's a question really of how big and how much of the slide it takes up. Because I enlarged them so large, I didn't feel like the number of lines that made up the icon was going to be distracting uh, because it's mostly if you think about that particular slide where you're comparing those side by side is you're highlighting the the size of the color is what sticks out to the person and the what the icon actually is is less important than it than the color shading if that makes sense uh, next question next question comes from Craig 
McFarlane in Boston for keeping slides that you think you might reuse. Do you reduce a deck to just the, to just the slides you might reuse, or do you copy it into a reuse this deck? Go ahead, Alex. <laughs> I have to admit, I just have lots and lots of decks, and I go, oh, I had that slide. It's easier for me to say I had that slide in that deck and then go grab that deck and then and then come back and, and pull it in. And I keep them all in iCloud so I can get to them from any computer that I'm using um, so that I, you know, that they're all there. Um, but I have, you know, 10 years of slide decks and oftentimes I have to, I'll grab them and refresh them and go, oh, this is a good place to start. And then I'll customize it for what I'm doing. Thanks, Aaron. Absolutely. I do try to keep a an original deck with just the main headers of the fonts I like, the timers I like, things like that. And then I add the extra slides in as I go for whatever I need. But I think sometimes when I'm in a little bit of a bind and I'm running a little bit behind, I might just copy the whole deck and just say, here we go again. So they might see the same timer or the same um, movement break. But for the most part, they understand how it flows. So they're usually not too disappointed. I like Alex, I like to use a um, online repository. We, uh, I'm Office 365 myself. What I will say is the other thing I use is I have a spreadsheet of different training items and it's called a learning object metadata list. And so I can quickly look through all my lessons and identify what slide deck I used for each lesson and where it's located. Uh, for today's example, I actually pulled in three different slide decks I have based on what the questions we were going to have today. I was ready to share uh, different examples of different complexity. And um, if we had fewer questions, I would have brought in some other examples. But I, I, what I did is I went through a whole bunch of old slide decks and just I knew which ones were, were bad and we need to update. And so I just brought those whole slide decks into this particular presentation is how I handled today. And next question. And Tony Mobley from Union Georgia asks, is the Canva presentations worth a look? Yes. <laughs> I don't know, Tony. Uh, I'm not very familiar with Canva other than there was an office hours about it about three weeks ago. It was on a Monday morning and it seems intriguing, but I'm not familiar with anyone who's actually used it. Uh, Tony? Yeah, I've been playing around with it for uh, house worship that I work with primarily. And it seems to have a lot of resources. And if you're interested in something that is, uh, has some built-in templates that have a lot of uh, color and a lot of uh, creativity in them, as opposed to, you know, starting with a, a basic slide on Keynote or PowerPoint, it is a, it's a, a good place to do a jump start where you can have something that really looks really nice and impressive with just utilizing some of the built-in templates that Canva already has. I think Canva in general is a great starting point for a lot of things. And if you, especially if you're the only user or everyone who, who needs the item has a Canva subscription or a shared subscription, uh, go for it. I think where, where I would struggle with that personally is uh, no one in my corporation has Canva licenses. And so uh, if it was just me using it for like an office hours, I would consider it. But in reality, in most of my life, most days, it's not very shareable in my situation. So for me, it, it's not the best choice. But for a lot of people, I think it's a great starting point, probably. Thanks, Tony. Uh, next question. Next question comes from Douglas Carmichael. Have you ever had to deal with corporate institutional standards when creating decks? For example, master slides you must use? Alex? All the time. <laughs> so so it's, it's kind of, uh, most of my work is Fortune 100 and sometimes Fortune 10 is really 90% of the work that I've done in the last little bit of time. And uh, they all have decks that, that you want to, and, and it ranges from horrible decks to really, really great decks. For the most part, once you get into the into the upper echelons, they hired an agency like Duarte or other people to build their decks for them and to build those templates and everything else. And they actually look way, they're just way, it's way easier to make something that looks really great um, that fits their guidelines, all the fonts and the looks. And a lot of times you have libraries of images that you can use. You have the icons that, they, you know, long lists of icons that they can, that they've, that they've um, approved. And it just is really, it's, it's generally not something you have to deal with. It's usually a luxury that you get 
with um, organizations that understand the power of communication. So, you know, it can even be down to, I've worked with some nonprofits, I mean, big nonprofits, but nonprofits that have just incredible guidelines and, and deck structure. And you learn a lot from, from a great agency that specializes on decks, building those decks out. You learn a lot about the layout and what's important. And so um, usually I look forward to those unless they are done by somebody in house. <laughs> and, then, and then you're just like, oh, my eyes, you know, so, so, but you, you know, but you conform because it's that, that's the, that's what you do. You're a hired gun. May I present exhibit A at <laughs> my shared screen? I did not. <laughs> choose the colors purple and other purple mm -hmm. and gold um, it makes it really really challenging I'm required on any decks that I share outside my department I'm required to use standard templates and, and a big problem with them is they're all white background and yeah. white space is much much harder to work with than darker colored space and it's like we said harder on people's eyes especially we're doing all of our training through Microsoft Teams now and it makes it incredibly challenging because I have to deal with these templates and they're hard to use. And our other company, our insurance plan has red and white, which is just as hard. And so it's it just makes it really difficult to share information when you have distractingly um, challenging color schemes or boring layouts and that sort of thing. So when I don't have to use it, I try not to. And then there's times where I have to use it. And in those times, I make sure I stay within our corporate guidelines um, and push it as far to the edge of those guidelines as I can to make it easy for my listeners. I don't see any other comments in our uh, chat, so we can end today. Thank you, everybody, so much uh, for a great discussion. Panelists, thank you for bringing your expertise to help us all make better slide decks and think about what are we trying to do when we're presenting to an audience. For our producers, thank you for guiding the discussion, leading us in a way I didn't think we were going to go. Um, but that's the joy of office hours and education hours is it's up to the producers where we go. And for all the crew on the back end, I know it's a ton of work. There's a lot of people training today. And every Saturday is an opportunity for all of us to learn, whether it's through Education Hour or on the back end. And if you'd like to volunteer, make sure you go to officehours.global to learn how. Like I said, the, the conversation continues in Discord. It's a community effort to make a great show. Thank you all very much for our show today. And based off, off of the two hours together, we traveled a total of 91,876 miles as we answered your questions. Have a great week, and we'll see you all next Saturday. Great insights, Aaron. Thanks for joining us today. And Tony and Arshid. We'll see you later.